ban everything because um, it really doesn't always work um, that way that something with a similar chemical structure does the same thing. Sometimes something that looks completely different has the same effect and you can't really predict that. So anyway, uh, oh, here I give an example of that. So it's a really confusing diagram and I simplified it um, in a minute. But basically this shows the antibody with PCP in it again. Or maybe it's a different antibody, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, and then this is a toxin peptide from some other source. It's a completely different structure. And so basically you have this protein that I just made it all blue. That's where the PCP is bound, um, interacting with all these residues here. And this is this toxin peptide. So it has similar maybe interactions in here, but it has something over here maybe, and it's just, it's something that's totally different, and it's doing the same thing. So it doesn't really work um, to just say an analog of PCP is going to be illegal and nothing else. If you base it on, oh, sorry, what? I, I just have a question. Yeah. Can, how well can you judge what the effect of the drug will be in the body based on its similarity in binding to an antibody? Well, you can look at if it, so basically, um, stronger binding typically indicates like a better interaction and more of an effect. So stronger binding in the case where PCP binds to something and either lets something happen or stops something from happening. I don't actually know what, but if this, maybe this is like a, an area where something would normally bind and then something would happen, PCP gets in there and blocks it. So if this can get in here and really tightly bind as well, it'll have the same effect. It could interact in a lot of different ways. So sometimes you can't really tell unless you do enzymatic type studies and, and just basically you look at the binding. Yeah. Um, okay, so now I'll talk about methamphetamine. Um, so this is methamphetamine. The swimming line here, it came up in another coffee house. Um, it just, it depends on, or it's showing that it could be either orientation basically, which are these. So in this case, this methyl group is sticking out towards you. And in this case, it's going back that way. And things um, can bind a lot differently and do different things if this is sticking out this way or if it's going back that way based on what I showed you before, the enzyme structures. So um, basically, this is meth. And then the hydrochloric salt is actually the crystal meth crystallizes and uh, smoke it. Uh, interesting thing I found out was um, that R methamphetamine is actually, it comes out in your urine if you take things like a VIX inhaler or some other medication, but VIX inhaler was the most interesting one. It, it's just a byproduct after you take that drug. It just comes out in your urine. Um, so when they do tests for uh, methamphetamine use, they have to really analyze your urine really well to make sure that um, you have S methamphetamine, this one, because that only comes from if you're taking the drug illicitly. Um, there are a lot of studies into like proper analysis techniques for doing this so you can <coughs> wrongly convict people. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're, so, they're so similar in structure. It's, it's really interesting that um, they can do different things. Uh, so you make meth, one way is from pseudoephedrine, which is this molecule. The classical way is with um, phosphorus, I think it's red phosphorus, and iodine. Um, iodine can be somewhat explosive in certain environments, um, so it gets a little dangerous. Basically, you just um, it's just a re some sort of reduction here without reducing the, um, the bond here. Get rid of water. More. Modern methods involve sort of like a birch type reduction, it's called with lithium and ammonia. Um, you get ammonia from fertilizer and they get lithium from those lithium ion batteries. So they extract it from there. So that's crystal meth. Pseudoephedrine <coughs> um, found in cough suppressant medications. Uh, they control the selling of those. They really try and monitor it to make sure you're not um, trying to get a bunch of it and start up a lab. And uh, it's, it's not too hard. 
as like if you can look to go from pseudoephedrine to here. As a chemist, I can say it's, it's not too hard, which is why they really, really strongly control this. But in some cases, um, they're starting to control substances that, from those substances to the actual drug, it's actually difficult chemistry because things are getting more sophisticated. Um, drug makers are getting more sophisticated. So uh, this is another synthesis for, uh, it's actually retro synthetic analysis because it's going backwards, but um, for methamphetamine. Um, basically, you can go from 1-phenyl 2-propanone to here pretty easily. Uh, basically, you just make, um, you turn this carbon oxygen bond, double bond, into a carbon nitrogen double bond, and then reduce it. So that's pretty easy stuff, which is why this is heavily controlled, which is a pain in the ass to a lot of organic chemists, apparently. Um, but this chemical isn't really that controlled, not in the same effect, because going from here to here is sort of expensive. You need a, a chromium reagent that is not too expensive if you're in a lab, but it doesn't come cheap otherwise. And this isn't controlled either uh, as much. It's not as easy to do that in just a garage or something. And this is subtle. So if you think about it, um, oh, and this is MDMA, so ecstasy. If you look at the structure of ecstasy, like focus on this part and then there, it's pretty similar to methamphetamine. You have the exact same thing here, and then you have that little extra cycle over here. So you could say that ecstasy is an analog of methamphetamine. Um, Saffrol comes from the Oh, I didn't write down the plant name. It was like Saffrasis or something tree. There was a genus of them. Um, you can isolate it from this tree, and typically that's what they do. Um, then there's these chemical steps you can go to to make MDMA or ecstasy. It's actually really tricky chemistry. Um, not, not if you have a lab like this and you're going out all the time, but I don't know. It was a little hard for me to just look at it, figure it out, and, um, but this is now, like, semi-recently, it has started to become controlled. So the government's really trying to crack down on these possible things that you could make into drugs, and, uh, yeah, what did I say here? Fairly sophisticated, not something you do in the rush. So I just sort of something to make you think about, um, People are starting to control sorts of chemicals that could be useful to chemists. They're starting to control chemicals that haven't even been made yet. That they have no idea what they do. Um, and yeah, that's basically my talk. Oh, I forgot to tell you about the first slide, though. <coughs> that's supposed to be a, like a ye old meth lab. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to say that. Okay, um, and that's everything. Are there any questions? <laughs> was I okay for time? Was yeah. that okay? Question. There's a guy there. He's got something on his head. In the back. He's above yeah. drug design. Do you know what that is? <laughs> you know what? I looked into it. Yeah. Wait. Which guy? This guy? No. Um, above drug design? It's okay. Okay. Is, that, is that a person? It looks like a tea killer. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, I'm just so wondering. they used to do <laughs> all sorts of crazy things in labs. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. Like, I read this, um, or I, there was this link last night, like, this person, it's basically, it's a journal article from 1927, and the guy at the end of the journal article has some notes. It's about, like, some synthesis that he did or something. And it says, uh, I suggest that you smoke during the reaction. Like, people used to just smoke cigarettes in the lab with all these extremely flammable solvents. <laughs> um, they would just sit there and, like, you know, they used to mouth pipe that too. But anyway, um, <laughs> apparently, hydrogen cyanide, even trace amount of it, really changed the flavor of your cigarette smoke in the lab. <laughs> and then you can tell there's a deadly gas coming at you if the fume has fallen or something. So, he's probably doing something weird that we don't do anymore. <laughs> Yeah. I actually have a question about the antibody binding. Oh, I was yeah. just like, um, so like, what do you expect to learn from that? Like, do you, because I, I would say that what if the antibody 
pulls the PCP into a configuration. Like, do you, can you really say that the PCP sits in that shape everywhere? Because... Uh, oh, you mean like... Because is it, is it possible that the binding to, <laughs> binding to the antibody changes the PCP conformation? Is um, that even relevant? I, I don't know. Uh, Such a well, small molecule. <laughs> I sorry, know. I think the I think the idea of the article and doing this antibody stuff was to get an idea of what kind of interactions there could be in the binding of PCP. Um, I couldn't find any sort of crystal structure or anything for what PCP actually binds to, um, mm -hmm. because it's a huge, massive membrane protein that they just haven't been able to figure out yet. So I think this was sort of like the best alternative to look at how it could interact. This is like the simple, this is made by the body um, to to interact with it. So it's sort of like even viewed as almost the best possible scenario mm -hmm. to interact with something really similar to it. Mm -hmm. So um, just sort of a study of. Yeah, so they couldn't get the, the actual information, so they went for the next best thing. Yeah, and it, it sort of confirms things that we would already think. Like, it is a really hydrophobic molecule, so you see that. It put together all these specific amino acids that really help with the binding of that. So yeah, it might help in the future when they figure everything else out. Yeah. Um, I could be completely wrong with this because I'm not really biology background, but my impression was that antibodies were typically smaller. Like, are antibodies do they just range from small little molecules to larger proteins? Because here it looks like it's a fairly large protein. Um. What? Antibodies can be quite big. I mean, they're they not can. like anywhere big, but like what PCP is like a, a single tiny this, molecule. Yeah, so this yeah. is a really and you have to think that all proteins are chains and chains of amino acids. Yeah, yeah. This, this actually, um, I don't know, it might look, so this is extremely, extremely tiny, like, ang like 10 to the, what is an angstrom? 10 to the negative? Well, I mean, like, I mean, I mean large yeah. four proteins. The larger like, proteins. Uh, I, so I don't think antibodies can get as big as some of like the biggest, pro like these huge these huge ones that PCP typically binds to, but it could probably get pretty big. Basically, if it folds right and can fit the PCP, then um, the body will use it. So, uh, yeah, I guess. Okay. So that, yeah. There's like there's around 100 amino acids at least in that particular antibody. Um, just by weight, they're, they're probably around. Like PCP is probably like, uh, one. <laughs> I mean, they're yeah, I, relatively they're probably smaller than some of the bigger proteins. But I, I, I always think that small molecules and proteins are on different size scale, because like small molecules are like way down here, at, like tiny amounts, and all yeah, proteins. Yeah, but I mean, how, how large is like a typical antibody that you would uh, that would attack a virus or something? Like that? <sighs> if, <laughs> I I should probably know that. Because uh, I, I always thought that. Dalton. Twenty Dalton. Yeah, maybe fifty. That sounds like. Something. Do you know what Dalton is? Kilo Dalton. Kilo Dalton. Kilo Dalton. Kilo Dalton. I guess like, can we do like, <coughs> like, I don't know, a size comparison like. <laughs> so there's a really cool uh, like molecule protein antibody type or like virus antibody ish. Does that make sense? PCP is smaller than a virus. Yeah, PCP would be smaller than a virus because a virus is made up of like a little capsid protein. So antibodies, viruses would be. But is that, that kind of the, like are antibodies typically quite a bit larger than a virus? Yeah, they'll have to be bigger so because basically it's, it has to be a huge long um, amino acid chain that then folds up onto itself to build a structure around the uh, the virus or just around part of the virus even. Part of it. I think that's how it works. Sorry, I don't have great answers. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.